Okay, well, I've got one minute past the hour, so or past the half hour, I should say. So I'm going to get started. Um, welcome uh, to Turf Tuesdays 2021. Uh, my name is Dr. Jim Brosnan. I'm excited to bring this uh, series uh, to you all again uh, in collaboration with my colleagues at the University of Tennessee Turf Program. Um, we started this last year kind of in, in the midst of the pandemic as a mechanism to deliver uh, pesticide recertification credits to the industry. And it was bigger and better than we ever kind of envisioned that it would be. The, the participation last year was off the charts high and we were able to uh, not only deliver credits in Tennessee, uh, but to other states as well and engage with uh, many of you from across the country and across the world. So we made a, a group decision to bring this back in 2021 and try to make it bigger and better than we did last year. So uh, in 2021, we'll have more sessions we're going to have more speakers. We're going to have speakers from other universities join us throughout the calendar year. Uh, and we have pesticide credits uh, in, in more states uh, than we had last year. I think we have 12 uh, different states that have awarded these webinars pesticide recertification credits. Uh, and we have continuing education credits from different uh, professional associations, including GCSAA, STMA, uh, in the American Sports Builders Association, which is new uh, for 2021. Before we get into uh, the kind of meat of today's session, I want to go through uh, some of the credit uh, details because I know that's important to many of you uh, that are with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, you saw when you registered uh, that your uh, data in terms of what state you wanted pesticide recertification in, your license number, and if you wanted professional CEUs, all of that is captured at registration uh, and will be populated into a, a Zoom uh, spreadsheet that we'll have access to at the end. And this will kind of serve as our roster for today's session. And it also tracks how long you're with us. So we need you to stay with us for the entirety of the hour uh, to get your pesticide recertification credits. And then that uh, spreadsheet that Zoom provides is what we turn into the different states uh, as a roster. So if you need credit in Tennessee, that gets sent to Tennessee. If you need credit in Kentucky, that gets sent to Kentucky. If you need credit in West Virginia, that'll be sent to West Virginia and so forth. So uh, make sure that that's all there, uh, that everything that you entered at registration is correct uh, and stay with us for the hour and you should be able to get your credit um, here fairly, fairly quickly. I should say, uh, we record all these sessions. We put them on our YouTube channel, our UT Turfgrass uh, channel on YouTube. Uh, so a recorded version of today's live webinar will be placed there. If you are watching this on YouTube now, uh, there are no pesticide recertification credits available. We only do uh, pesticide credits for live viewings, and that's a, an important detail. For those that are joining today's webinar from New Jersey and want pesticide recertification credits for the state of New Jersey, uh, there's a couple of extra steps that you'll need to do in order to make that happen. Uh, we'll have all of your information come in through that same uh, Zoom roster that we talked about earlier. However, I'm gonna need you to take a um, picture uh, time stamped with your photo ID and you can either put that in the chat or you can email it to me personally. And I'm gonna need you to do that at the beginning of the session and the end of the session, because uh, New Jersey requires that for pesticide recertification in their state. So that is uh, one extra hoop for those in New Jersey. Uh, so if you can make sure that that happens to get New Jersey credits, that would be uh, much appreciated. We'll also uh, periodically throughout the session, you may see a, a quiz or a poll come up uh, that, again, is part of what is required for pesticide recertification in New Jersey. So uh, we can, uh, you may see that pop up through today's session and in other sessions throughout the year. And then lastly, if you have questions as we go through this, uh, we would like for you to put those questions in the Q&A box that is at the bottom of your screen. Um, if we have them go into the chat, it just gets a little bit messy and harder to answer. 
We're going to do our best to try to answer all of your questions as um, we go through today's session. Uh, and if you can do it in the Q&A uh, box, that's just going to be easier for us to manage. It keeps everything threaded by topic uh, and really well organized. I think that does it for kind of the, the under the hood uh, mechanics of getting uh, you all what you need in terms of your uh, continuing education and pesticide recertification credits. Uh, I'd like to introduce my, my co-presenter for today, Dr. Tom Samples. How are you, my friend? I'm fine. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, everybody, for participating. And we've got some other folks from the turf team that'll join us periodically uh, throughout the session here as well and, and help with the Q&A as needed. I think, Tom, you know, one of the things that that we got out of 2020 in doing this, I think we kind of learned how to do this a little bit uh, better each time we did it. And hopefully you and I don't mess it up and we can build on that today. <laughs> <laughs> well, that remains to be seen, Jim. Um, you know, I think as we had sessions, these started out as um, pretty much show and tell PowerPoint. And over the duration of the year last year, we kind of got to a place of, uh, things being a little bit more conversational. And that's going to be our, our goal today is to try to have uh, a conversation about tall fescue and tall fescue lawns because, well, it's master's week and this is kind of a, a flag a flag bearer for spring, right? It sure is. So, and now if I remember correctly, Jim, that's a ryegrass course right now. It is a ryegrass course. It's overseeded rye, and from all the reports uh, down on the uh, Augusta National that we hear through the Golf Channel and other places, it's 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 firm, fast, and dry, and everything they want in uh, in an overseeded ryegrass golf course. So I imagine it'll be different than uh, than it was in November. Yes. Well, why don't I do this? Why don't to give us something to talk off of, Tom, and, and our friends joining us, something to see as you and I chat back and forth about all things tall fescue. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to put up a pretty photo of the tall fescue lawn that you shared. Is this a is this a tall fescue lawn in Knoxville? Yes, it is. And very I met close, very close to a restaurant that uh, that I attend uh, participate in. <laughs> And is this probably, probably a midsummer photo or is this a spring photo or uh, it's uh i think it was taken in june okay yeah. so right before it gets really hard on tall fescue right? yeah yeah <laughs> yes you know i mean i think this is the time of year across across tennessee and i know you know in knoxville fescue lawns look awesome right now and you know they've been through they've been through a little bit i mean if you know going into a little bit of data you know we've had a really cold spring compared to last year um what you see on the screen here i quickly went into our uh, measure io dashboard to retract uh different climate parameters across tennessee at, at various locations and this is average temperature uh for january february and march 2021 is our uh, red bar 2020 is our gold bar and 2019 is the green bar. And you can see in January, we were almost four degrees uh, colder in January on average in 2021 than uh, the previous year and about three degrees colder in February. And if I move these tiles out of the way, you can see just about two degrees colder in March. Any thoughts, Tom, and what that might have done to fescue as we, we got into the early parts of 2021? Well, one thing that I really appreciate about the tall fescue, Jim, is uh, particularly when we've interceded in the fall and maybe even a little late in the fall, uh, it, it's still, that species still surprises me at times in terms of how the seedlings recover, how well they recover in the spring. So, uh, in terms of mature plants, I think we've seen some frost damage. You know, it's just basically at the tips primarily. But, uh, but I do think that the tall fescue turfs that I've been on, uh, there's definitely been some density improvement. I, and, and we're beyond the seedling color stage now. So, uh, so I still think it's a pretty doggone resilient uh, species uh, coming through the winter. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, it, the fescue stance that I was on, you did, you saw a little bit of stress, uh, particularly in the harshest parts of the winter. But, you know, by now, I think we're well through that and into kind of a, a real sweet spot for fescues to kind of bulk up and get ready for the summer that's ahead of them because it can be a difficult time for a fescue lawn to get through a Tennessee summer. And I guess at some level, we're going to talk about that here. Um, you know, just kind of highlighting really quickly about how cold it, it, it's been. I put this slide together for some of our sod growers uh, out in the middle and western part of the state. We may have folks from, from Nashville, Jackson, and Memphis listening who remember this maybe not so fondly. You know, I, I joked it was not a not so happy Valentine's Day. If you look at maximum and minimum air temperatures for that period in February of February 12th through the 18th, uh, pretty stunning. I mean, you look yeah. at, this is just for the sum total. So the, the lowest temperature recorded and the highest for that period of time, I, Memphis was below freezing, which is indicated by the blue line. Jackson was below freezing. And Nashville was just below freezing as well. So the, the high temperature never got above freezing um, for that seven day period. And, you know, I know our, our friends and colleagues who grow Bermuda grass had a lot of concern when this was happening. I mean, you know, I think our fescues, as you've noted, are well prepared to get through this. But one little kind of side note, you know, the folks in Memphis and Jackson like to joke about how much warmer they are than us. Well, when they were freezing during this period, our minimum and maximum temperatures were uh, pushing 50. You know, we were 20, 20 for the low and almost 50 for the high during that same um, February 12th through February 18th window, which was pretty noteworthy. I think uh, the, uh, the valley certainly uh, spared us. Well, and Jim, uh, the, uh, you know, some of my great friends in Marion County reported uh, earlier this weekend that basically their Bermuda grass had not only been frosted back, but uh, both uh, the, the uh, football field and the practice field were completely dormant again. Yeah. And that's, yeah. You know, and that's, that's Marion County down near Chattanooga. So uh, it, it's really interesting. And one thing I always try to remember uh, this time of year is, uh, well, and, and particularly in February, March, April, um, you know, it, I'm reminded that years ago, I read something that said it takes uh, three times the energy to raise a gram of dry, uh, a gram of water, one degree centigrade, compared to a gram of dry soil. So when those soils are moist, even though the air temperatures are fluctuating and, and getting up there fairly high, uh, you know, you take a tall fescue turf that's maybe maintained at a height of cut even at two inches, uh, there's still quite a bit of insulation value. And uh, if, if there is a little bit of thatch involved and, and the soils are moist, those soil surface temperatures can be very slow to respond. Yeah, we have compared, compared to what the air temperatures are doing. We haven't lacked moisture. That's for sure. It's, <laughs> well, it's, and there's uh, probably, and I, and I want to shout out to all your professional lawn care applicators uh, for, for you to take an hour out of your day to be with us today, knowing how busy you are and how I'm hoping that you're, you're seeing the, the light, you know, at the end of the tunnel. But uh, I can only imagine how, how you had a scramble this year for round one and, and so on. So uh, we really appreciate you being here today. Yeah, I second that. And, and the scramble, I think, is a really good word for it because, you know, I, I was looking at some, some rainfall data with, with uh, Greg Breeden yesterday about a, a research trial that we put out um, in, in Kodak, Tennessee. Uh, it was initiated on March 16th, and we've had almost six inches of rainfall in the 14 days at the 14 days since that date, there was almost six inches of rainfall at that site. Wow. It was, re and you know, when those numbers are low, you get into Nashville and points west of here in that yeah. same time frame. I've heard upwards of eight, 10 inches, depending on where you were in, in the state during that, that late March window. It had to make things really, really hard for, for lots of folks. 
Well, and I remember just to, you know, and I don't, I, I intentionally do not have a rain gauge, but uh, in Norris, you know, north of Knoxville, of course, you know, those of you that are familiar with the topo maps, Knoxville's kind of down in that donut hole, but up at Norris, we got five inches of rainfall in a three-day period, and yeah. that, that's a lot of rain for us. Yeah, it was, it's been really nutty, and, you know, you layer that on with the idea that as soon as we get some warming in March, and you see one yellow bloom on a forsythia, yep. people want to take rapid action yep. uh, in terms of going out and putting out pre-emergence herbicides for crabgrass control and tall fescue lawns. And it's some of that, you know, is it's a rounds based business and round one's got to go in a certain window of time, which, which I understand, you know, this plant that you see on the screen, many are probably familiar with, with border forsythia and that, you start to see these blooms when we have soil temperatures um, at 55. And that is the same kind of window where we see crabgrass seed germinate in the soil. Um, and this kind of serves almost as a traffic light for crabgrass control uh, in lawn care. And you start looking at when we see this benchmark be reached gets a little interesting. So, you know, this is, this is our research farm in Knoxville, um, soil temperatures for this spring. Um, on the y-axis, this is soil temperature. I left that in Celsius, but what I've done is I've indicated the 55 Fahrenheit um, benchmark that we see for Scythia bloom as the heavy black line um, that goes left to right here. And we have all of our soil temperature data for January, February, and March. And, you know, you can think about this and there's plenty of lawn care operations that go out, you get a warm day, you know, and your soil temperature, you know, you're out in late January, you might have air temperatures that are above that 55 mark, your soil temperature isn't there and you're applying early, that can be an issue. You know, it wasn't until late March that we had sustained soil temperatures in Knoxville above 55 and they even dipped back down below um, shortly thereafter. And we see similar trends across the state. You know, this, so this is Chattanooga, same thing. You know, we're, we're coming up on 55 here in, in January at points. Um, we cross over it in late February, early March, but then rapidly go back down again. And it's not until the end of March where we're just above the, above the line. Here's Nashville. Again, we, it's in my time in Tennessee, uh, which I guess I'm pushing like 13 years now, which is crazy to think about. Um, we've always had this fall spring where yeah. we get a, a period of warming. It might be seven days one year. It might be 10 days the next year where we get really warm, really fast. And you see rapid, rapid action in yards. People going out, doing things to their lawn, doing whether it's ornamental plants or their lawn, they're, they're out in their yard and they're doing things. And it's just really too early to, to get serious about doing that sort of stuff. And it, it happens every year. We saw it in 2021. Nashville, we're not above that 55 line again until the end of March. And then this is Memphis as well. You know, we hit it a little bit earlier in March in Memphis. Um, but the message here is if, if you're a lawn care professional and your pre went out in this window in mid-January to mid-February, you were early, which is good, right? It's better to be a little early than it is to be a little late. I'm not going to ever argue against that. But it's one of those things that the earlier we put it out, the longer of an ask it is for us to keep us crabgrass free. And we need to be prepared that if we've started in, in February and now we're layering on six, eight, 10 inches of rainfall, it's probably wise to start thinking about maybe another pre-emergence application that's gonna go out April, May window that can help you with extended crabgrass control. It's gonna help you on the goosegrass front. Um, it's been our recommendation for a long time and I think as these springs have developed, it's needed even more. Well, and Dr. Brosnan, when you think about it, I'd love to, at some point, I'd like to superimpose 
soil microorganism activity over a graph such as this, but I've got to believe that the soil micro microbial activity also spiked about the same time those temperatures spiked. Now, a spike, not, not necessarily, probably a mini spike compared to what you're going to see in terms of the activity of the decomposers and so on. But, uh, you know, and again, your herbicidal selection is so important. You're, you know, you, you consider solubility. And when you look at, when you look into the half-life data, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting in terms of the variability of the half-lives based on soil texture and and environmental conditions at, cert at a certain temperature. Well, and, and it's funny, you know, I, I again, I, I fully understand I'm an OCD person and I'm, I'm early to everything. Um, I, I, I get the, the drive to be early, but I, I'd encourage folks to remember that, you know, our last frost date in, at least in Knoxville is, is mid to late April. I mean, we, yep. we had frost here. Um, on tall fescue this weekend right um and you, know, you think about crabgrass seedlings and frost maybe you got a little bit of emergence in that early spring window well, those plants they all died on saturday morning um you know I'll, I'll tell you tom i don't know if i've ever told you this story but so i'm a new professor here in, in 2008 um and going into the spring of 2009 as a brand new professor, new to Tennessee, knowing we're going to do crabgrass control research, you know, I sit down with Greg Breeden. And as soon as we get over 55, I'm like, okay, we got to oh, get yeah. organized and get our, <laughs> our crabgrass protocols out. Yeah. And, and, you know, I don't want to miss it because, like, this is the first go of it and want to do a really good job. And, and uh, you know, he kind of talked me off the ledge and went, well, you know, we're going to get a couple of frosts. It'll be okay. Yeah. And I've never forgotten that because he was exactly, he was a hundred percent right. And, and took me as a newly minted rookie professor and just kind of calmed me down a little. And, you know, I think that that's a lesson that many can relate to, you know, we'll, we'll we're going to get some frost as we go throughout. It well, and I'll, I'll bet you that if Mr. Breeden were pressed, uh, he could probably refer to, to dogwood and blackberry and, you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, Tennesseans that I've talked with that, uh, that have the same color hair I have now, uh, they have certain terminology for these, uh, these various uh, change in conditions in both spring and fall, these warming conditions. So yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad Mr. Breeden kind of uh, talked you off the cliff. <laughs> you know, and I, I clicked over this slide really quickly, and I think this is a good metaphor that you can relate to. You know, every one of us has a cell phone, and everyone can relate to the battery on your cell phone dying over time. So, you know, I share this in a pre-emergence herbicide context that if you're a lawn care operator, the minute you put that pre-emergence herbicide on the ground in a tall fescue lawn, you're starting to pull on that battery. And it is going to slowly drain over the course of the summer. And there's various factors that do that. And, and that's a little bit beyond the scope of today's session. But um, think about the earlier you start, it's the, it's the longer you're using your phone, right? And that's going to, if you're starting in February, you're, it's unlikely you're going to get to September with any charge left in your, in your battery. Your phone's probably going to die and you're probably going to need to plug it back in on the charger to get you there. Same thing's true here. If you start a pre-program in February, you're, you're going to have to recharge that system in order to be crabgrass free um, through labor, through Labor Day based on- Well, the and Jim, the other, you know, I'm thinking, boy, we've come a long way in terms of post-emergence crabgrass control, but the key word there is post and many of many of as you know many of the clients that our audience members uh, deal with they don't like to see the weed no for sure no i i i weeds that are visible are callbacks so tom let's you know i don't want to make this an entire herbicide discussion you know there are other things that the folks listening as they get their tall fescue lawns ready for the year need to be aware of other than crabgrass although i could talk about crabgrass all day as I could talk about Paul yes, all day, can. but um, yes, you can. For those you know, in the audience that don't understand the Dr. Brazen's O, what did you call it? OCDC? OCD, obsessive yeah. compulsive disorder. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not I, super I've bad, spent but I've got many hours in an automobile with him, and 
a crabgrass talk is it's that's good for like at least 90 minutes <laughs> well let's talk about some other things that our our folks listening could be on the lookout for moving forward i mean you've got this pretty slide here of shade stress on tall fescue you want to elaborate on that a little well you know i found that uh, now back in 1973 i was just you know out of out of uh, high school and entering college and i was interested in the turf grasses at that time and uh, i was a twinkle I in my this, dad i was a twinkle yeah. in my dad's eye and yeah i'm sorry but oh. uh yeah a little long in the tooth <laughs> and long still long-winded but here's the deal jim it's interesting that he didn't say just experience shade. He said experience shade stress. And the term stress, I think, is uh, worth discussing. The other thing that I think is worth discussing in this particular slide is an estimated 25% or more back in 1973. Well, one of the most interesting presentations I've heard in 2019 was by the by a state forester that stated that you know here in Tennessee we continue to plant more trees. We might not be planting the same number of trees as a previous year, but we're still planting more trees than we're harvesting. And I so I if I was going to uh, you know we're now we're what now we can bet on FanDuel right? Yep. So uh, if I was a betting person. I would bet that we've got more shade in our home landscapes across this state than we had in 1973. Yeah, I think that's an easy statement to make. But not only the shade stress, but think about the root competition for moisture for nutrients. Um, there's so many very ver there's so many different types of shade, but the term shade stress is truly accurate. Shade creates stress. It's just not that the turf grasses are lacking energy, but they're stressed by the fact that they're 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 being managed in at some level of shade. And then if it's a moving shade, think about how the turf may be stressed every day. Once the foliage returns to those hardwood trees, uh, you know, you they're they're let's say that. And, and many of the audience members know for a fact that, you know, the turf may be a little stronger. Uh, the tall fescue turf may be a little stronger when it receives full sun in the morning and then becomes shaded in the afternoon. But what about the flip side of that that occurs every day where the turf is shaded maybe four or five hours during the morning hours and all of a sudden, boom, full direct sunlight. I'm, I'm struck right now, Tom, by, uh... Steve Rabidou, the superintendent at uh, Wingfoot, who, who hosted the U.S. Open last fall, I heard him say on a podcast once that when his members were talking to him about tree work and, and shade, you know, the way he communicated was, well, you don't see really nice turf in a forest, right? Yes. That's, that's yes. kind of true, you know? <laughs> yeah. you you see a lot of Japanese stilt grass, which is right. you don't see event. really nice turf in the forest. And, <laughs> yeah. and you know, that that kind of speaks to the what you're getting at here. And yeah. we had a question come in, Tom, that's kind of related. Um, you know, the, this person is asking about fescue blends now for a new renovation um, when in lawns that are particularly with shade. Is there any particular variety? Um, or blend of varieties that um, would do well there. I mean, I think I know you're going to talk about fine fescues intermixed with tall fescues. Yeah, here, and, and even blue grasses. But Jim, the interesting thing is you, you and I both know how difficult it is to conduct shade trials. I know uh, years ago at Oklahoma State University, uh, the uh, researcher there, Greg Bell, remember Dr. Bell? Yep. You know, and, and one thing he found was in, in his shade trial work was that, you know, we're, we're taught that green light is reflected, but his work showed that green light is photosynthetically active. You know, even though we have red and blue wavelength light. So we, we've got to remember that in shade, uh, the quality of the light is just as important or the lack of quality is just as important as the intensity of the light. But uh, 
But, you know, when you go to the National Turfgrass Evaluation Program and you look at the tall fescue trials that have been conducted, I think we're into our fifth trial now, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you know, so tall fescue has been evaluated for years. I remember the first couple of five-year uh, evaluation periods. You know, Kentucky 31 tall fescue of forage type it took a while for the improved turf types to distance themselves from the performance of the Kentucky 31 with the endophyte. You know, but nowadays these improved turf types, when you look at the overall quality and performance of most of these improved turf types, they leave Kentucky 31 in the dust. But, but, uh, but in terms of actual data regarding the performance of tall fescue varieties and choosing varieties specifically based on shade performance, it's just not there in the literature. Uh, that now, so this reinforces in my view, the value that I would place on blends versus a, you know, a standard variety. So how, yeah. how many in the audience have heard our, our variety tested first, you know, in the NTEP trials? But when you go back and look at the means of the varieties across the transition zone states, there might be 24 varieties out of the 90 plus varieties that are being evaluated that are in the top group. So, uh, so um, one thing I do know though, Jim, and when it comes to shade, in many cases, the performance of the improved turf type tall fescues in shade is also impacted by the density. And in my view, we can have a turf grass density that's too strong so that the airflow that we get in a shaded environment, if it's limited, I think sometimes the perform, and I've gone back and looked at this on a small scale, but some of the very dense dwarf types uh, just from, and I'm just, I'm just speculating now, so I don't have this, you know, this is just a, a guess, but I'm guessing that some of the more open varieties may perform a little better than some of the denser dwarf types in a shaded environment where you've got the combination of shade plus restricted airflow. Well, it's funny when you start thinking about turf grass breeding efforts, density is one of the things they breed for, right? Yeah, they have more yeah. vertical growth, higher shoot density, darker green color. It's yeah, it's interesting. Well, and I remember years ago, uh, and again, I'm dating uh, my my uh, myself, but I remember the uh, varieties Bonnie Blue and Barren. You know, the Kentucky bluegrasses in the National Kentucky Bluegrass Trials, they really stunk up the show in the Northeast, but here in the transition zone they perform pretty well. I was really disappointed when they took Bonnie Blue out of the marketplace because for those homeowners and those sod producers that wanted to, you know, mix a Kentucky bluegrass at 10% seed weight by weight into a 90% seed blend of tall fescue, Bonnie Blue performed pretty well in, you know, as a, uh, as a component of a turf grass mixture of improved turf type tall fescues plus bluegrass. And it did kind of have a, some of the wider bladed bluegrasses actually uh, were pretty well received by our sod producers in, a, in this state. So, um, but, but uh, I guess, I guess, unfortunately, here's an area where it's going to have to take some research on your part at your particular locations. But again, I would uh, I would encourage encourage the use of blends as opposed to one variety. Well, and I think too, you know, with anything like this, it's a communication issue to the homeowner about kind of the limits of the site, and you know, explaining maybe a little less gruffly that you know grass doesn't grow in a forest. Um, that there are going to be areas on the property that are going to be ideal for tall fescue, and there are going to be other areas on the property that aren't ideal for tall fescue, or maybe any other grasses. Um, you know, and in, in, in going through the steps of having that conversation uh, with the client, I think is is useful. And 
you know, I, we, we could go on and on about shade at, at length if, for the rest of today's session if we, we wanted to, but I know there's some other things that we need to talk about to kind of get folks ready for the tall fescue summer. Um, and I think that communication piece is important for all of them, right? You know, one of the things our goal as a, as a turf group here at the university is today is to kind of arm you with these things that are going to be on the radar that you probably are already aware of and maybe give you something uh, to take away from today to have conversations with your customers um, about these issues as they come up this summer. You know, Tom, another one is, is, is water stress or drought stress. You know, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine right now with how much rain we've had, but as is joked about quite a bit that we have rains in the spring and then it stops raining for a while around here. Um, yes. You know, what, what have you seen with, with, drought in fescue lawns in your extension career? Well, I've seen the value of an effective and well-designed sprinkler system, automatic controller. I've seen these systems basically abused sometimes by our homeowners in Tennessee in that they, you know, they're not all that familiar with the clocks and how to set those necessarily. But uh, in, in when it comes to irrigation of a lawn, particularly on the peripheral of shade, uh, periphery of shade, I've, I've had a discussion, re discussion recently with uh, Mr. Larry Tankersley, who many of you may know, he, he refers to himself as a dirt forester, but he's actually, uh, he, he's actually an ecologist. But what I've learned about tree rooting and how far the tree roots can extend beyond the drip line and how that many of the roots that are actually, some of the roots are truly uh, anchoring that tree while others are mining the soils for minerals and water. Um, so, uh, so one thing I'm, I'm pretty confident in saying is that even if you're, uh, you know, the, the best turfs, in my view, are going to be in full sun, wide open, uh, plenty of wind flow, uh, good good airflow among the plant population, very you know fairly low relative humidity, so the the turf grass can continue to transpire, move water and evaporate that water from the leaf surface. Uh, when the turf grasses cannot use the transpirational water to maintain an internal proper internal tissue temperature, this is what happens. Uh, so I kind of wish we all had irrigated, you know, I wish sometimes the expectations of our clients, and I'm talking about from a professional lawn care standpoint, from a golf golfer standpoint, uh, sometimes we just don't have all the tools and in the inventory that we need to be able to deliver a uh, quality product during the summertime. Now, if you put irrigation in there, but you're still dealing with restricted airflow and, and shaded areas and soil comp uh, soil compaction, it's not a you know it's not a cure all. But uh, in many cases, when we lose a certain number of plants of tall fescue on the peripheral areas and in the shaded areas. Uh, it may be simply due to a lack of available moisture rather than a lack of photosynthetically active radiation. Well, and I think too, you know, there's a case to be made that just talking about this is, you know, this is not abnormal what you see on the screen. This can happen and that fescue plant's going to survive. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a conversation worth having that you might have to talk a homeowner off the ledge that they think they've lost their lawn, but we know that these fescue, these fescues, particularly the newer varieties, can can get through this. You know, particularly if maintained at a higher cutting height. Um, you know, this is a really good slide you put together, Tom. That's illustrating mowing height on uh, effects on root growth. You want to you want to talk our uh, attendees through this? Sure. Well, this, a good friend of mine, Tom Cook, uh, used to be the horticulturalist and he taught turf grass, grass courses at well, as well at Oregon State University. And so uh, 
I, I gleaned this slide from him. This is actually a Kentucky bluegrass sod, but the reality is we could demonstrate the same thing with uh, most all the turf grasses. Um, but look at the impact of mowing height on rooting depth and root mass. Um, so hopefully if nothing else is gained in terms of knowledge from today's uh, presentation, if you just remember this slide, um, you know, we, I still think that many of our homeowners in Tennessee, ma many of our professional lawn care applicators are doing a fantastic job of controlling weeds, insects, and diseases, but the homeowner has the, uh, the right to mow or, or maintains <laughs> the, the right to mow. And then look, look what happens. But I would say, look at the root to shoot ratio. So again, when you look at the ratio of roots to the ratio of shoots or the aerial shoots, it's probably pretty constant. But think about how much advantage that sod on the left has when maintaining the two inch height of cut. And again, this is still within the optimum mowing height range for this particular species. So it's Kentucky bluegrass maintaining a half an inch up to two inches, but it's just dramatic in terms of the uh, massive uh, amounts of root tissue, and and you'll notice still what it, I'm guessing. I wish I wish he, I wish we would have had a yardstick by this, but at a depth of about four and a half five inches, look where that cutoff is in terms of the you know the majority of the roots are within that top four inches. Now this right. is an excellent loam soil, you know. Right. It, so basically, it's consistent. The fertility level was consistent. The amount of light these these uh, frames received was was uh, was consistent. So the only thing that's changed here is the mowing height. Well, and we got a really important question here. Uh -oh. um, uh, someone who's with us asked, "Is this the ideal cutting height for the Knoxville area?" And I'm pretty comfortable in saying, on a tall fescue lawn, the answer to that is no. I'd no. like you be no, double. No, no, this this height. is no. Now this, I wish uh, you know. We could duplicate this in terms of the tall fescue and the Bermudas and so on, but this represents Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, now this was up in uh, near the Willamette Valley in Oregon, but uh, so so I really really good growing conditions. But the reality is, uh, in my view, the uh, I like to recommend at at the residential turf. Uh, from on the on the residential turf side, I still think uh, a minimum cutting height of two inches is good, and I don't and and I really like to recommend even as high as three and a half inches. Yeah, this is a general that, recommendation for mowing. It, it, it's important that you clarify here for those listening: two inches would be the minimum, the lowest, the yeah. floor. We'd love to see you in a two to four inch range. Yeah, but that's a hard sell with with the homeowner, right? Because if you're mowing at three, you know, three and three quarters inches, well, you got to mow more often. If they can scalp that, you know, scalp that baby down to an inch, well, then it's a longer gap in between mowings, but it doesn't help them um, on the turf quality front at all. But you know what, Jim? I, I wish I could put my hands on the article, but the reality is when you're scalping that lawn back, now, now that maybe our, we've got better horsepower in terms of our uh, our mowers, but uh, I would venture a guess that if you're taking two steps forward and one step back and scalping your lawn as a using a push mower, you're probably going to spend nearly as much time in the lawn scalping it as opposed to mowing it at a higher height of cut. They do like to clog, don't they, when you scalp them? <laughs> yeah, yes, they do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me, this is, we've got uh, some more time left in today's session before our hour runs out. Would be remiss if we didn't talk about brown patch, Tom. Um, this is, and boy, this is where Dr. Horvath and Dr. Wyndham uh, are salivating. You yeah, know, they, for sure. And, and they, you know, in the they, spirit of full transparency, uh, the lawn that you see on this slide, this is the lawn in the first home I ever owned in Knoxville. Um, so this is my lawn and uh, several years ago, uh, I since have moved to a new house with a Bermuda grass lawn, but. Uh, now, wait a minute, Dr. Brosnan, how did you, how did you achieve the Bermuda grass lawn? Uh, I like to say I seceded, 
right? So I had a mixture <laughs> of Bermuda grass and tall fescue. Yeah. And I just decided that, you know, in the middle of a global pandemic, the good thing I could do would be to spray out all of my tall fescue, fertilize my Bermuda grass, see where it would grow. And then that would be the areas that I would have turf and it would be Bermuda grass turf. And then the other areas where it wouldn't grow would be landscape beds. And well, and then just to carry on this, that thought, what I remember when one Dr. Sorokin was managing Kentucky bluegrass under irrigation. And then as I recall, I believe he has now gotten a uh, zoysia grass uh, turf that he's managing in his residential area. I think, you know, I think he has Tiff Tuff in his, his house. Oh, no, no, I'm, oh, yeah, I misspoke. He's got Tiff Tuff. So, yeah. okay, so, but basically, I think it, it, it is, uh, it is interesting. What I'd love to do is know uh, our professional lawn care applicators uh, that are attending live, I'd love to know what percentage of their lawns historically that have been cool season have been converted to warm season. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. And one of the things that I tell folks, you know, cause I get a lot of Bermuda grass control and tall fescue questions, right? And there's yeah. no really good option for that. You know, we have things that will suppress Bermuda grass. And when you, when you make timely applications of those herbicides coupled with tall fescue interseeding you can make some headway, but you're just going to keep doing that in perpetuity, right? Right. Because at the end of the day, if there's a Bermuda grass infestation in your lawn, that's kind of nature telling you Bermuda grass wants to grow in your lawn. And if I've learned nothing in my career, it's you don't really want to try to fight against nature. Um, so I would encourage those that have habitual Bermuda grass infestation problems to maybe rethink grass species because it, it's an uphill climb um, if you're continuing to have Bermuda grass problems in a tall fescue lawn. Well, and particularly if the client is not mowing too closely. Correct. You know, I, I always say if you want to convert tall fescue to Bermuda grass, mow it a half an inch. Correct. You know, but so uh, this, uh, what's on the screen, going back to Brown Patch, because again, I could go into a weed control conversation and we could be lost for the remainder of our 12 minutes together. Um, this is a Brown Patch risk model um, and Dr. Horvath is with us. He can chime in here um, uh, if he's got uh, time to do so or availability to do so. Um, this is for Nashville, Tennessee last uh, in 2020. Uh, this is a model that was put together um, by Mike Fidanza uh, when he was at the University of Maryland. And it basically looks at weather par parameters associated with the risk of a brown patch outbreak in tall fescue. Um, when I put this together, I didn't have a real complete understanding of the way that the model uh, was operating. So, you know, my inference was, well, if your risk is greater than zero, you have some risk, which is why the, the bold line there um, is on zero. Um, but I've come to learn uh, from talking to, talking to uh, Dr. Horvath that really the key number here is about that five, six range, which is a little bit higher that when we're into that five, six number, that's when we have um, a pronounced risk of brown patch. And, you know, this was apparently studied uh, when Dr. Lane Treadway was at NC State, and it didn't really perfectly match up with observations on tall fescue lawns in North Carolina. So it's really just a guide. But if you kind of look at this as a, as a guide and just as a, uh, a swath, if you will, you know, if we look at when that purple line kind of gets above zero and into that five, six range, well, it's kind of in this area that shaded blue, which is right about the middle of May, maybe Mother's Day weekend to October 1st. And that's kind of interesting to me. You know, I'm, I'm no pathologist, but I've heard several folks that manage lawns talk about how brown patch season kind of ends when summer's over. And when we get into Labor Day, summer's over. Well, I think in Tennessee, summer continues through uh, through August and well into September. At least it has the past few years. And 
you know, our brown patch risk here, at least according to this model, was still elevated um, through the middle of September last year. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Braz and I also believe that uh, if, if we pull Dr. Wyndham's uh, diagnos diagnostics uh, data for brown patch in terms of what he sees coming through the lab, I think uh, I would be surprised if it didn't mirror this. Well, and what's interesting too uh, is you even look, we've got a couple of points, at least in Nashville in October, where we've got a, a, a you know, a spike in risk, if you will, um, mm -hmm. last year. And, and, you know, I don't know if that's atypical or not atypical. Brandon, I don't know if you're if you're available to to chat on that, but you know, it, it would be interesting if if that's atypical or just kind of an anomaly or outlier. Tom, in your in your experience, would you say that that's an outlier to have risk in October? Well, um, I don't, you know. If, I'm not a pathologist and uh, don't claim to be, but I have seen brown patch uh, in, in turfs. Actually, um, as we go, let's say from uh, Cookville to Jackson on Tall Fescue, uh, I'm not sure that that would hold true in Mountain City. I think Brandon's on now. Yeah, I'm yeah, back on. Good Sorry. deal. We need a deal. So, Jim, would you be a pathologist to talk to us? You, so, would you frame that question again? So, my question, Brandon, we, this is good that you're here because we need real pathologists to, yes. to, to us rather than, <laughs> than imitators. Um, you know, this model, and granted, it's just a model, but it showed yep. elevated risk of brown patch in, in into the middle of October. And Tom and I were curious, is this typical? Is that an outlier to have brown patch risk that late into the year? Well, and, and then the other key is how long it stays above that critical value that that the, the model as it's published is six. You could adjust that threshold up or down based on your observations of where you see disease and also like your expectations. If you want to be more conservative, you might adjust that model down a little bit. If you want to be a little more liberal, you could adjust it up a little bit. And then it, the duration of how long you're in that risk category, it's kind of like what you were showing with the temperatures for crabgrass, right? Like, so those little spikes, like in, in October, where it just spikes just above six for a day or two, that's probably not going to be enough when we've just had that cold period beforehand where the the risk is very low and actually below zero whereas like if you look into like june july august where it's kind of bouncing around popping up above six dropping back down bouncing back up above six in those middle ranges that's where you're going to see the the bulk of your activity and where you want to be really you know proactive in getting preventative fungicides out the the other piece of this uh what and i don't know if you mentioned it jim but uh Treadway actually looked at these models and how they would perform in North Carolina. And they predicted brown patch pretty accurately on a pretty consistent basis with one major exception that kind of hints at that maybe we need to adjust the model a little bit for our region. And that was any time that there was precipitation within the 24 hours prior to a predicted uh -huh. e exceeding the, the, the threshold of 0.1 inches or more then then it was a false alarm essentially so it said it was going to be brown patch and there wasn't any brown patch observed and that kind of tells you a little bit about a how important even uh light irrigation events can be in reducing the impact of you don't want to be too wet but you can use yeah. irrigation certainly and there's been published work on this to reduce your risk of of a brown patch outbreak and and, and certainly in, in those situations where natural rainfall, you get a light natural rain in that 24 hours just prior to a little bit of an elevated risk, that can dampen that risk a little bit. So 
you can use this model that's available to you as a guide as to when you can expect to see some activity and then try to to be proactive in your management inputs at that point right like choosing a fungicide or if you want to be a little more conservative you could you could be on a program or if you are like well I want to know kind of when to time my one or two applications that I'm going to put down for the year, then you might want to wait until it bumps up and it's kind of, uh, kind of like there at the beginning of September, end of August, where it's up and it's kind of elevated and it's kind of hovering along above, above six, that might be a period of time that you want to, okay, that's when I'm going to spend or make my application. So there's a number of ways you can use this model, but I think the, the critical piece for like the October time period is that when you get into those periods of time, you get that, that increase, you go above the risk threshold, but on both sides of that peak are some pretty steep uh, periods where you're well below a risk level. That makes sense. Well, and Dr. Dr. Horvath, the other thing that when you think about it, some of the professional lawn care applicators, uh, they, they would wait for the client to, alert them that they're ready for a fungicidal treatment. So right. when you think about activity in October, uh, say mid-October, by the time the lawn care professional can get on that turf, the, the threshold may have already been, uh, it, it may, may be already in the no risk category again. And, yeah, for sure. And of course, the other question is, you know, have you already interseeded the lawn so that you can count on the seedlings to develop and to mask some of the uh, some of that uh, um, some of the symptoms? Yep, absolutely. So while we have a real pathologist here, I need to ask this question because we're also running out of time. But I think this is important, Brandon. Am I remembering correctly that last year in Tennessee and I in and in North Carolina there was more maybe gray leaf spot than in previous years and it was misdiagnosed or just kind of confused with brown patch? Uh, certainly in North Carolina, um, there was a lot of gray leaf spot. I don't know the extent to which we had as much here. We certainly didn't see much of it at the farm. We'll see it occasionally uh, on tall fescue, but certainly over in North Carolina, there was a significant outbreak of gray leaf spot in August and September that really uh, dramatically uh, decreased turf quality in a lot of uh, lawns and, and, and uh, tall fescue stands. And uh, it's certainly something that we need to be paying attention to. Basically, the way gray leaf spot works is that we get an import of, of spores from the atmosphere. They've been blown up in the, in the wind uh, farther south and, and the plume kind of moves, moves north uh, with, with the overall circulation of, of the atmosphere. And we get a significant increase in spore deposition in like August to September. We saw this almost every year when we used to grow perennial ryegrass at the research farm, right. uh, we would we would have to really fight gray leaf spot for about two months, and it would often decimate most of the perennial ryegrass uh, that we didn't have under heavy fungicide control. And it's also the reason why we don't see a lot of perennial ryegrass anymore in the transition zone for for uh, golf courses and things like that. So it's certainly a problem to be paying attention to. Um, if you're not sure, the symptoms are remarkably similar to brown patch. So if you're not sure which one you have, getting a diagnosis through the, the plant and pest clinic uh, with Dr. Wyndham is an excellent suggestion. Uh, making sure that you know what it is that you're, you're trying to control, that's a, that, that's a big piece of the puzzle. And, and Dr. Ho Dr. Horvath, one of my best slides that I've ever taken of gray leaf spot was on uh, large crabgrass. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So sometimes your enemy can be a, a diagnostic aid. So yes. I think and, and, and one of my uh, w one of my harebrained ideas was using using gray leaf spot to uh, control crabgrass. But um, it's, yeah. it's just that a harebrained idea. <laughs> yeah, but that's you're allowed good. you're allowed about a dozen of those a year, Dr. Horvath. Well, yeah, I mean, that's part of what we get paid to do. So Brandon, before I wrap this up, um, 
same fungicides that work on brown patch work on gray leaf spot or no? Uh, to some extent, yes. The, the biggest challenge with gray leaf spot is that there seems to be a pretty significant amount um, of QOI resistance. So if you're relying on QOIs for brown patch, um, that, that could make it difficult. And I suspect that might be why uh, they saw such a dramatic, uh, you know, epidemic last year with, with gray leaf spot is that a lot of the, 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 the gray leaf spot isolates were QOI resistant. So you got lawn care operators out there spraying QOIs and, uh, and, and you have a pathogen that's resistant to it, that, that's going to be the pathogen that gets a hold of the turf rather than the brown patch that's plenty sensitive to the QOIs. And, and because of its biology, you're not going to have as big an issue with, uh, with resistance development. So um, the SDHIs are an option. Uh, and even right. some of the DMIs are effective. One of the, one of the fungicides that's probably the gold standard for, for gray leaf spot is thiophanate methyl. And I, I'm, I'd have to double check, but I don't think that that's labeled for use on home loans. So that's, I, I don't think that, so either. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a difficult part of the, the you know, the challenges that on home lawns, you, you, you don't have access to some of the materials that may be some of the most effective. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense for sure. Well, I've got 1230. Um, so I think, hey, Jim. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. There's a question about blue muta that Tom might want to answer real quick if he can in the box or live, Tom, however you want to do it. Tom, can you do a, an answer to a question real quick? I don't know what the betting line on that is. <laughs> I can sure give it a shot. Now, you know, when it comes to the blue muta, we, you know, it's in terms of Tennessee. Uh, in talking to our seed our seed uh, vendors, there's more out there in Tennessee than you might than I thought, but uh, we're still not pr promoting it uh, here at the University of Tennessee. We're still investigating. Uh, we don't have any research trials, but uh, it is uh, it's a very topical uh, uh, it's it's uh, of interest to several sports turf managers. Um, so what's the specific question, Greg? The, the question, the question's about blue, blue muta for a home lawn. Okay. Well, um, Mitchell Moat and um, Booker Lee in Shelby County, and I believe Mitchell's in Middle Tennessee, Rutherford County, uh, they, they both have demonstration plots where they've, uh, they're managing home lawn culture intensity. They're trying to manage the combination of uh, a really good uh, heat tolerant bluegrass. Uh, one is uh, one, one from uh, Greg Munshaw's, uh, what is that called? The Mountain View Seed Company. Uh, so the bluegrass is, if you're going to investigate this, I think it's critically important that you identify a, uh, Kentucky bluegrass, it's really strong in terms of uh, heat tolerance and uh, summer patch resistance. Um, I'm not convinced that, uh, that a homeowner, you know, there's a lot we don't know about it. Uh, we don't normally recommend seeding Kentucky bluegrass in the spring. So, you know, the question is, can I, if, I'm, if, if I see the uh, Bermuda grass getting too strong and the bluegrass really weakening, can I still just, uh, can I effectively seed in the spring? There's some questions we don't know, but uh, so, so when I get a question about blue muta at the home lawn level, I encourage people to, if they're interested, take a look at it on a small scale, but, uh, but don't, uh, you know, don't go wholesale on, on five acres of uh, residential turf. Does that make yeah. sense? I think that's fair, Tom. I mean, it's it's certainly new, and look, you know, we're learning. Those who have it are learning. We had. I know that uh, Oklahoma a, State, Oklahoma State's looking at it, Dr. Brosnan, right now, and you know, with their, uh, you know, their, their, they've got a strong Bermuda grass breeding program, and uh, but again, in talking with our seed sales personnel, the Northern Transition Zone, it's it's being 
Um, I would say most of the experience is north of the Kentucky line and also St. Louis. So I, I, they've had some success. Now, the work that I've seen uh, has been sports turf and golf course. And in a previous webinar, uh, we've one of the uh, really, really fine individual and fine golf course superintendent was looking at uh, looking at Blue Muta with Vaymont Bermuda grass, which if you remember Vaymont, uh, that was one that was uh, quite popular years ago. It's more of an open canopy, a little bit wider leaf blade than some of the uh, other Bermuda grasses. Fairly easy to, to uh, overseed and had really good success uh, last year with fairways. He, he was managing a uh, golf course with 36 holes, 18 of which were Faymont fairways and and then the uh, the other eighteen were newly constructed, and he went with a with another uh, variety. But uh, the members chose; they really enjoyed playing on that Vaymont Bermuda grass base. Had been interceded with the uh, with the Kentucky bluegrass. Yeah, no, and and I, I would encourage folks um, to check that out. That's on our UT Turfgrass YouTube channel. I believe that was the June twenty twenty. Um, it's either June or July, Jim. Either June remember. or July, um, uh, Turf Tuesday from last year, and that's recorded, and you can watch the whole thing on YouTube, and you can get varying perspectives. We had an individual on who had success with Blue Muta and an individual on who had failure with Blue Muta. So you can kind of see it. And then one, and one who was traditional Bermuda grass overseeded with ryegrass. So yeah, so you can kind of see all from, from all the perspectives and kind of you know, take from that what you will. Um, I have on the screen right now, this is our GCSAA education points code here. Um, so make sure to jot that down for those of you that are live and are, are participating today for GCSAA education credits. If you are watching this on YouTube, you want to submit this number and you also want to submit this event date, April 6, 2021. So if you're watching this in the future, whether it's June, July, August, later on in the summer of 21, when you submit this to GCSAA, you want to list the original event date of April 6th. I will stop share there. Dr. And Brosson, if you don't mind, sum summarize again, our friends from New Jersey need to make sure and do what? Thank you, Tom. So if we have anyone from New Jersey that needs New Jersey pesticide credits, um, we asked at the beginning that you show your uh, photo ID with a, in a timestamp in the picture. Uh, we need you to do another one of those at the end and then email me uh, those images. I have to keep them on file and submit them to the state of New Jersey uh, for you to get your New Jersey pesticide credits. So other than that, I think for the rest of the states will be covered. Uh, all that stuff is captured at registration. Um, I thank everyone for participating today. Uh, we're going to have more um, sessions throughout the entirety of the year. Uh, you can find all of the information um, on TennesseeTurfGrassWeeds.org. You can register for every webinar uh, for the entirety of 2021, and you will need to register for each one individually because each one is its own unique pesticide credit roster. So just because you registered today, doesn't mean if you want to come back in May or, or June or July, you don't have to register again. We need you to register for everyone as a unique event because it's a unique pesticide credit roster for the different states that we will um, be submitting to. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this session. We certainly enjoyed bringing it to you and we will see you on May 4th for our second Turf Tuesday of 2021. And that- Hey, Jim. Be, yes. Just to interrupt really quick, uh, Rodney St. John, uh, thanks for that, Rodney. Put in the chat box that, and and uh, I appreciate the clarification. I just wasn't 100% sure, but he, he mentioned that it is labeled for professional use, uh, just not by homeowners. So homeowners can't there apply, but yeah. the, yeah. but the, uh, but it, but it is labeled for professional use. So that, that's an excellent option for gray leaf spot. That's Thank you, Rodney. Enough. Hey, Jim, I want to also thank our county extension professionals and, and Carla Keene for 
helping us market not only to uh, to our our fine green industry and professionals, but also uh, we really respect our county extension professionals and appreciate their attendance here today. Yes, for certain, and look forward to seeing everyone uh, May fourth. Uh, it's going to be um, a, kind of a, a different format. We're going to bring in Dr. Matt Elmore from Rutgers, uh, and he's going to talk about POA control and cool season turf. And then uh, myself and the team of folks that uh, I work with here uh, in the weeds group, we're going to talk about POA control and warm season turf. So kind of POA north and south and uh, review everything we've learned in the last uh, POA season. So until then, we'll see you on May 4th and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.